Hi, it's Kernatex here with a new series continuing the journey through different versions of Linux through the years. So what I'd originally planned on doing was to go from the last version I did in the previous videos, which was Linux from scratch 4, straight to Linux from scratch 6.3. But unfortunately, I came across loads of problems with that. It was a jump too far. Um, I think part of the reason was the fact that the uh, kernel had to be updated to 2.6 and to be compiled with a particular version of GCC. So some requirements there, obviously to do with the structure of the way the internals of um, the kernel work. Um, and obviously the, the versions that Linux from scratch 4 was using weren't up to scratch or didn't have the uh, capabilities to compile a good version to allow all the other packages to be built correctly on 6.3. So uh, I did end up trying to rebuild it several times and basically doing workarounds and so on to get it uh, to pass a compile on one package to get it a little bit further. And in the end, I realized I was probably just fixing problems and introducing others. So I decided to go to version 5, which is a version I remember using quite a lot because it was quite a a nice version. There's lots of things to do with it um, in terms of instructions to follow. And some of the instructions aren't immediately obvious in the text and not um, in a box out at all. So it's not obvious. You do have to read it a little bit. But when you do compile it. I found it to be quite a robust version of Linux as I remember. I tried it on several different machines and with several different source Linuxes um, as hosts. So yeah, that's what I'm going to be doing in this current series is to go from Linux from scratch 4.0 to Linux from scratch um, 5.0. Um, and as I say, it's quite a robust version in my opinion. I think it, you could look at it as an updated version of 4. So yes, the packages have been updated, but also I think the manual has been polished off a bit. It's starting to look a bit more like a proper document rather than something that, without any uh, disrespect to the authors, um, rather than something that's just been put together, it is starting to look like a, a professional document. But in no way am I saying that the older versions of LFS are not professional. They certainly are. In, in what they do, it's just the appearance of it, the way it's laid out. Um, and as we'll see when we get onto the next version, which will be 6.3, um, you'll see the, the manual starts to look much more like what it does these days. So because I've had to go to 4, um, unfortunately I'm sticking with the Pentium 233 MMX that I've, I've been building um, the previous versions of Linux and Scratch on version 1 and version 4. I don't have any hardware. In fact, there's a gap. I've got various PCs and uh, between this Pentium and between the next machine I've got, which is a Pentium 4, I've got a hole in my collection, if you like. Um, and there's two reasons for that. One was because um, at the time it was a bit tight for money and I couldn't afford upgrades so much. And the upgrades I could afford, I had to go for the AMD chips because they were a little bit cheaper. Um, also not quite as reliable, although I did upgrade... Um, the it was a K62 I think I had in the end um, up to a 500 megahertz one uh, because it was a super socket 7 board I had it allowed me to just swap the chip out so it was a cheap upgrade um, however the last time I tried to use that chip was maybe a year or two ago um, I think there's something wrong with it where it just causes random crashes I thought initially it was the motherboard and a capacitor pro problem but I've tried the in fact, the same Pentium 233 that you can see on the screen now that's running the screen now. Um, and I didn't have any re random reboots at all. So I think there's something wrong with the chip itself. So, And uh, as I say, like, I didn't um, have the funds to buy Pentium 2s or Pentium 3s at the time. So there's a generate or several generational jump or a jump through several generations for me in terms of hardware. Um, the next build will be on a a P4, but unfortunately this build is going to be, as I say, staying on this Pentium 233 MMX, so unfortunately it's quite slow in places, 
Um, when I was testing out the build, I did run tests uh, initially. Um, I won't be running them because they do take some time. For example, GCC takes four hours on this machine to run the tests, whereas it only takes about 75, well, I say only takes 75 minutes to compile. It's still quite a while on what at the time for a Pension 4 would be hardware that's probably about eight years old or so. Um, in terms of Linux and Scratch 4, it's released in November 2003, so it's now an operating system arguably that's about six years newer than the Pentium 233, so the hardware is getting a little bit on the old side. Um, but as I say, it still builds well. It, I can't remember if it needs to use much swap when it's building GCC. If it does, it's very minimal. It's not sitting there thrashing away at the disk. So, disk. So, the 64 meg that the Pentium 233 has got is still adequate uh, for its building. It's only got one core anyway, so it's not got great demands in that respect. Um, but yeah, it will take a little bit of time, unfortunately. As I said, I'm not going to run any of the tests. Um, it'll just extend the build unnecessarily and as I have built it, it builds successfully. The test that I did run um, matched, well for example the GCC that runs, I think is at the beginning, yeah in chapter 5, um, there's a link there to the tests on the gcc.org webpage showing the results and the results I got were identical to the results that have been published on the gcc.org page so I was quite happy with that. So overall, it was a uh, you know quite a different experience to going from four to six to three as it was from going from four to five dot zero. There was one um, fix I had to do to get GCC to com uh, was it GCC? Sorry, it was a fix to GCC I had to make to get. Um, just checking through my notes, or is that in the later six dot three? It might actually be in 6.3. As I say, version 5 was quite a robust build. No, it looks like it's in the next update. I did the update from 5.2 to 6.3 to make sure this was possible to do. And it looks like it's in that next update. So maybe I'll mention it in, in those videos. So anyway, um, may as well get on with it enough chit chat so i've started the p233 machine this is the actual output from the screen that you can see on the screen it's um booted you can see there's the host name lfs4 so if i just log into it and you'll see we've got um well let's do an f disk uh, you'll see we've got the seven partitions there. We're currently using HDA7. And um, this doesn't actually show you there, does it? No. But yeah, we've, I'll show you the FS tab. This, if you followed the previous videos, you'll see this is all the same. Uh, yeah, HDA7 is the root. And we've got a separate boot partition on HDA2 and a swap on HDA3. So what I'm going to be doing here is purely creating a partition for Linux from Scratch 5 and then rebooting. And then when I've rebooted, I'll be on a remote machine to start the build so that I can have a, a graphical interface to copy and paste the commands uh, directly into the terminal. Uh, and uh, as you saw at the beginning of this video, it booted with Lilo um, version 2, I think it was. And I think this version of Linux from scratch actually installs Grub, as I remember. So we'll be overwriting Lilo, we'll be leaving that. Lilo, I thought, was always a bit of a funny bootloader because it stored the actual um, sectors, the actual physical sectors of the disk to find the kernel image. Um, which, yeah, I can understand a foolproof way of locating the uh, kernel image. Um, but also it means that if you update the kernel image, it's going to occupy a different sector. And if you forget to run the Lilo update, then it still points to the old sector on the disk where the um, previous version of the kernel was. 
So it's a bit, um, well, unfoolproof, if you like. It's not foolproof in that respect. Whereas Grub um, just stores, I don't know what it stores exactly, maybe the name of the file or something. Um, so it's a bit more intelligent in that respect. Plus you've got um, an environment where you can do some basic commands to uh, fix, maybe fix a machine that's not actually booting correctly. Okay, so I'm going to do fdisk slash dev slash hda because that's the first disk. If I just print the table up again, you can see it's there. I'm going to create a new partition and I'm going to press enter so it begins at the end of the previous partition. It's picked that up automatically. So I press enter and then the size, well, Again, two gigabytes should be more than enough. Um, I'd imagine one gigabyte would be enough to build this in and possibly a lot less. Um, but I'd like to give myself plenty of space in case I need to maybe take copies of directories or something while I'm testing these things out. So let's put that in there. Let's just print that up. So there it is, it's created. Again, I don't know if it's um, the version of E2FS progs or if it's something to do with the kernel, how it interprets the disk. Um, but you can see once again, we've got a different size for uh, a two gigabyte partition. So it could be it's trying to align the sectors. Um, it could be that it's taking a binary or a decimal uh, gigabyte. Um, I don't know, but it's slightly different, but not to worry, it's, it's roughly correct. So I need to write that to the disk and because that disk is in use because we've got two partitions mounted it it comes up with this message so i do need to do a reboot anyway i'll do that now and as so when the machine comes back up we'll be logging on remotely so i'll start the reboot now and log out and come back <clears throat> 